Good morning. I'm so happy to be at the house of God. Amen. And I hope that's <clears throat> you as well. Uh, I remember a certain preacher was asked, why so much people are converted under your ministry? He said, when I aim, I aim at the heart. And when I thrust, I thrust to kill. That sounds quite dramatic, but the Bible is a sword of double edge. And God wants to kill the old man and take away from our lives anything that must go that the inward man may be renewed and live to be able to be part of the kingdom. So our warm welcome today is not only to us that is present here. We have people watching us from different places. So we would like to say welcome and welcome again to this amazing seminar where we have at least four speakers, Bible-based preaching, amazing sermons. We're ready to hear it. And we would like to say that God has a special message for his people. And unless we are willing to receive it, we're not going to benefit from it. So think about the book of Revelation, like the way it starts. It could have started like uh, the whole negativity of witchcraft. It could have started like spiritualism, how to understand it. But God chose to begin that book with the phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And last but not least, one more thing I think about when I think about this seminar is Pilate. As he come to Jesus, in John chapter 18, verse 38, he said, what is truth? And what did he do right after? He left. So who ask the questions and then leave the classroom? So it's quite interesting. So he wouldn't get the answer. So if today that is your desire, like Pilate, to know what is truth, please stick around. And God has a special truth for us today. And in the mouth of Maboshe Makesa, coming from Atlanta, Georgia, we are today going to hear what is truth. Again, welcome and please stick around. Amen. It is amazing to be here this morning, especially in light of everything that is taking place. I am so happy to be fellowshipping with you all here. And I just want to thank you all for coming to our Revelation of Jesus Christ seminar, where we are going to be learning about so many different things that are going to impact your life in a positive way. Practical things that we can take with us that are going to give us peace and hope and joy and answers to truly navigate through life. And as we begin, I just want you guys to have two things. The first thing is a tangible item. The second one is tangible, but we can't necessarily feel it. The first thing is a Bible. This book right here is going to be the book that is going to help you to understand everything that we're going to be talking about this morning. And for those who are viewing, feel free to grab your Bibles as well. The good thing is a majority of the verses are going to be on the screen. So if I'm going too fast through the verses, feel free to just grab a pencil and paper and write them down. And then you can go back over them later and review them so that you're able to see if what I'm actually saying is true. The second thing that you're going to need is your brain and the mind. Now, the reason why you need your brain is because I want you guys to think, reason, and truly just try to process everything that is being shared with you as we're speaking to you today. But before we begin, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much again for the privilege that we have to come and get to know you. And Father, as we open up your word, and as we get to seek more about who you are, I'm just asking that you'll be with my mouth, be with my words, help them to be clear. And Lord, whoever is watching, whoever is listening in the audience, I'm asking that you'll speak to them personally. Help their ears to be open to hear what you have to say to them. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever been told a lie? People smile and chuckle. Every single person here, I'm sure, has been told a lie at some point in their life. Think about when you were told that lie, how did that lie make you feel? What was it like to be told a lie and then you might have believed the lie so wholeheartedly, with your whole heart, as the song said. 
sincerely, it calls you to live a certain way, to act a certain way, and to do things in a very specific way. And not only just that, you might have even shared that lie with so many different people. And as a result, they were affected. And then later on, you come to find out that it's not true. You know, lots of people are being lied to today. Children are being lied to by their parents. And they're being told things that aren't true. And they find out that it's not true. And then they grow up finding out that there's no one left who they can trust. Parents are being lied to by their children. And they don't even know if they can truly hope and trust that their children are safe. Not knowing if they can trust that they're going to be okay when they go somewhere. Not knowing if they're going to do something behind their back. Wives are lying to their husbands, and husbands are wondering, you know, is there really anything stable inside of my life? Husbands are lying to their wives, and there's wounds and emotional pain, and lots of people are being lied to. You know, it's really interesting. There's lots of information in the world today, and when you think about lies, it's because people are trying to understand. They're trying to learn about life, and all the information in the world today, especially in light of the pandemic that we're in with the coronavirus, Tons of information being spread on the media, tons of information being spread in books, you see on YouTube, all over we're being bombarded with information. And people are wondering, is there anything left to hold on to? And family, this morning, we are going to be going through something that we are all asking for, and that is, what is truth? We're going to dive deep to truly understand, is there really anything left that we can trust? Is there anything left that is stable, anything left that is consistent all throughout that I can hold on to, something that I know is going to be solid? And you know, I took the liberty of looking up in Merriam-Webster the definition of truth. And look at what they said. It's really interesting. It says, the first one, the body of real things. But not only just that, it said, the state of being the case. Have you ever heard someone say, this is the case? But this next one also was something that really hit me as well. It said, fidelity to an original standard. In other words, is there something that you can say, you know what, that's just the way it is. This is the case. Or is there something that you can say, you know what, this holds true to an original standard. And is there an original standard in the first place? And what exactly is real? And you know what's interesting? This journey for truth has been sought after for a long time. We're not the first ones to ask this question. A man by the name of Aristotle, he said this, he was a philosopher. He said, to say what is, that it is, or of what is not, that it is not, is true. Now, when I first read that, I was like, yeah, he was a philosopher. <laughs> Basically, in other words, to say, you know what, that's just the way it is. Have you guys heard that before? That's just the way it is. Or to say, that is not. In other words, you're saying that your word has power. Your word holds weight. There was another philosopher who you all may be familiar with as well. His name is Plato. And he had a theory known as the correspondence theory. We're not going to go into detail. But in other words, it was a theory that was basically saying what corresponds with reality is truth. In other words, what is it that we can see when we see reality around us? The trees are green. The air is, you know, it moves and it hits us. And, you know, I feel this way and I do this, you know, different things that we all experience where we can all say, you know, this is reality. What is corresponding with reality? Is there anything solid? There was a man by the name of Jesus. He said in the John chapter 17, verse 17, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Your what is truth? Your word is truth. In other words, Jesus was saying, the word is that which is going to correspond with reality. He was saying the word is that which determines what is. He was making an amazing, bold statement. But it's really interesting. Later on, you begin to ask the question, why is the word truth? Where did this word even come from? The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of who? Of God. In other words, Understanding where this word comes from is an amazing step in trying to figure out, is this really true? Now, why is it important to understand that God is the one who gave us the word? Who is God? The word says in Jeremiah 10, verse 10 and 12, but the Lord is the true God. He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. So it's pointing out that he is God because of his ability to create. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
So it's important to know that God inspired the word because he's the one who created everything. He's the one who set up an original standard. Remember, that which, is, that which holds fidelity to an original standard or that which is, an ori- is original. So when you're looking at the word of God and then you see that the word was given to us by God, inspired by God, and then you see that God is the creator, it starts painting a clear picture inside of your mind. But not only did he create all things, Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come. In other words, not only did he create all things, but he also has always been. Now, if he's always been, that means he's always been there. So therefore, when anything came into existence, he's the person who knows the standard for everything. Now, this is really, really huge. Now, the next question would be, how? How did God really give us this word? How did this word come about? If you look in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, it's not a private interpretation. These men of God were used to give not their own words, but a message from God. And then it gives an example in the Bible. It says in 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was in my tongue. In other words, when God communicated his word to him, he then sent that message to other people. And Paul also talks of an experience. He says, you received the word of God, which you heard of us. You received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of who? Of God. In other words, Paul was saying, you guys received my word, but you weren't receiving the word of a man. You were receiving the word of God himself. And this is really, really powerful. Now, it's really interesting because when you look at the Bible, and it was written by all of these men, so many different men from different points of history, a lot of these men, some of them didn't even know each other. And you know what's interesting? They all still had the same message. And the Bible is very interesting because as you're looking at it, you'll find that it says a lot of the same things, but in different ways. And we're going to look at an example how multiple different authors, they might have said something, the exact same message, but they said it in a different way. And this is very important to understand how God is communicating his truth to us. We'll look at an example from an author known as Paul. When he wrote to the Romans, he said in Romans 13 verse 10, he said, love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. In other words, when you love what it truly means to fulfill the law or when you, what it truly means to complete the law, to keep the law, is to love others. Now, this was Paul who said this. Now, look at another author of the Bible or another um, writer in the Bible. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, John says, He who does not love God does not what? Know God. So in other words, John is saying to love God is to know God. But he's not only just saying that, In another place, there's two chapters before that, he says, now by this we know him if we keep his commandments. Now John said to love God is to know God, right? Or to know God is to love God. And now John is saying here, to know him or to love him is to keep his commandments. So Paul is saying to really keep God's commandments is to love him. To really love is to keep the commandments. When you look at Paul, he's saying the same thing. He's saying to love, that's what it looks like to truly fulfill the law or to keep the commandments of God. So you see, as you're looking at the Bible, as you're looking at truth, these men who are are communicating the thoughts to God, they were basically communicating the same message, but they said it in a variety of ways. And as we keep on going, we might ask the question, what for? Why did God give us the word? What is the purpose of the truth that he gave to us? And listen to this. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of who? Of me. Now back then, when Jesus was saying this, the only scriptures that they had were the Old Testament. So what he was basically saying was, when you look through all of the Bible that they had back then, he was basically saying, this is all pointing to me. 
But he illustrates this even more clearly in a different account in the scriptures. In Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 32, we're not going to go through the whole story, but this was an account where Jesus had followers. And these followers were walking down a road, and this road was headed to a place called Emmaus. And as they were walking to this place known as Emmaus, they were really discouraged. And the reason they were discouraged was because basically they had been following Christ for a majority of their life. And they had so much hope in Jesus. And now that Jesus had been killed, they had lost hope. They were discouraged. They wanted some hope. They wanted assurance. And then a guest comes along the way, and they didn't know who it was. But later on in the chapter, it says that it was Jesus. And it says here in verse 27 of that same chapter, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures concerning himself. In other words, when it says at Moses and all the prophets, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that was all written by Moses. And then you have the prophets after that, Daniel, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, and, and Isaiah. And basically, Jesus started at all the books in the Old Testament, and he was going through, going in detail, showing how all of the scriptures talk about him. And this just shows us that when you're looking at the Bible, when you're looking at the Word, God gave us the word of God so that we could know about Jesus, so that we could really know who he really is. In John 17, verse 3, Jesus said, And this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In other words, Jesus is saying, if there is a purpose for life, if there is a reason to live at all or a reason to live forever, the whole purpose is to get to know Jesus. So when God gives us his word, he's giving it to us for the purpose of getting to know him, getting to know who he really is. And you know what's really interesting? Jesus said something else about himself. He said something. What did he say about himself? In John 14, verse 6, the Bible says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was basically saying, I am the truth. But I'm not only just the truth, I am the way, and I am also the life. Now, this is very, very important when it comes to seeking for truth. The reason why, a wise man in the Bible said, in Proverbs 14, verse 12, he said, there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Friends, there are lots of people in this world who are living according to their own way. They're trying to do their own thing. They're seeking for their own way of life. Lots of people are on this journey trying to understand, how do I navigate through life? How do I deal with this situation? How do I deal with that situation? But as a result, people fall into so many different traps. They get involved with drugs. They get involved with physical abuse. They have all this emotional abuse. They're financially irresponsible, so they lose money, spending money on things that they shouldn't spend. And it's like this trial and error through life trying to figure out what is the real way of living? How do I live? How do I navigate through life? I mean, I'm here. I've been told this one thing by one person and another thing by another person, and I'm going to try this out. And I'm sure every single person in this room can relate. We can all testify that we've had the experience where we've seen in Jeremiah 10, verse 23, the way of man is not in himself. It is not a man that walks to direct his steps. You've seen that as you navigate through life and you've had these stumbles, you've had these falls, you've had these mistakes, it's like, wow, that didn't work. I need to do something different. So when Jesus was saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's giving you assurance. He's saying, you don't have to keep on seeking for a way to live and keep on failing. You don't have to continue living this life of trial and error, of figuring out if this works or if that works, but you can hold on to something solid. You can trust in me. Amen? Amen. But it's really interesting. Jesus wasn't only called the way, the truth, and the life. He also had another name. In the book of John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the what? The Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 2 says, the same was in the beginning with God. Now this is amazing, because Jesus is basically telling us, He is the Word. But how do we know that this is Jesus? If you look in Revelation chapter 19, if you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to go to verse 11. 
The book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Very, very easy to find. When you get there, say truth. Amen. I didn't hear everyone say it, so we're going to wait just a little while longer. Revelation 19, verse 11, and we're going to read through verse 13. And we're seeing how did Jesus identify himself? Revelation 19, verse 11 through 13. When you get there, say truth. All right. So the Bible says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and what? True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And then it says in verse 13, And he was clothed with a vesture or a garment dipped in blood. And his name is called the what? The Word of God. So when you're reading this and you're looking at the context of this, you see that this is Jesus, especially when you look in Revelation chapter 1, because he says he's the faithful and the true witness, and all those parts are written written in red. And whenever the Bible is speaking and it's written in red, that's Jesus speaking. Another name for Jesus is the Word of God. And that's huge when you're thinking of everything that we just looked at. And how do we know in John chapter 1 that that was speaking of Jesus in the first place? In verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who became flesh and came to dwell on this earth among us? Jesus. So Jesus is identifying himself as the word of God. Not only that, if you, keep, if you read, keep reading earlier on in that same chapter, it says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And this is really interesting because Jesus has already said that he's the way. He's already said that he's a truth. He's already said that he's a life, and he's the word of God. But when you look at those verse, it says that that word was with God and that that word was God. So Jesus is saying, I'm the one who created all things. I'm the one who made everything. I'm the one who set up the standard. I'm the one who determined what is and what is not. I'm the one who set up something that can really be tested and where everything else has to be compared with. He was able to say that he is truth. Amen? So this is really, really interesting because not only did he just create all things, but it says in Psalms 33, verse 6 and 9, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Jesus was saying that he spoke everything into existence by his word. Friends, he spoke everything into existence by his word. He's the one who created all things, and he's called the word of God. When you're reading this book, when you're reading the Bible, you're not just reading words on a page. You're interacting with God. You're getting to know him. You're getting to understand a person You're learning who he is. You're understanding who he is. It's not just thoughts. You're getting to know the God of the universe who created all things. Amen? Amen. And not only just that, he's speaking all of these things from the heart. Have you guys ever heard that phrase, he said it with his heart or he spoke from the heart? It's really interesting what the Bible says about speaking things from the heart. Matthew 12 verse 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So when God was speaking things to us, He was pouring his heart out. Have you guys ever heard that before? Pouring your heart out. That person came to me and they were pouring their hearts out. And that means they were just talking and talking and talking. Jesus has been pouring his heart out to us in the word. He's been telling us everything, everything about himself, everything about life, everything about how to live. But not only just that, did you know that in the Bible, actually, I gave the answer. Did you know that there's only one person whose mind you're able to read? Only one person, and that's God. Look at this. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, verse 7, it says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, science people, is the heart, the organ that pumps blood, is it able to think? So when the Bible says, as he thinketh in his heart, it's comparing the heart to the mind. So when the Bible is saying, out of the abundance of the heart, or out of the abundance of the mind, the mouth speaketh. In other words, all of his words are coming from his mind. All of his words are coming from his heart. So when you're reading the word of God, 
you're not just reading words on a page. You're learning truth, and you're reading and understanding the mind of God. Isn't that beautiful that we get to read the mind of our creator? The only person's mind who you need to read is the creator of the universe so that you can know how to navigate through life, so that you can know how to do things, how to live life, and really appreciate this. Now, this alone should show us how important reading this book is, but we're still going to see how important is Bible study. How important should it be to actually study the Bible? What else did Jesus say about the word of God? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, he said, Man shall not live by bread, what? Alone, but by some words. By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus is letting us know that you cannot live by just bread alone. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever fasted before. I have tried to fast. And for those who have gone on a fast or ever tried to fast, have you guys ever had that experience where you're fasting and then your stomach begins to make like weird little sounds? Like, and you know, it's, it's wondering, you know, where is the food? Like, what is going on? And people who are skinny like me, you can't fast for too long. Otherwise, you'll begin to notice. And you know what's interesting? When you go without food for a long time, your body begins to feed on what is known as adipose tissue or reserved fat. In other words, the fat that's in your body is starting to feed off of that. That's why people get very skinny and malnourished. And you'll see pictures of people who look very, very weak and deformed when they haven't eaten for a long time. Friends, it's really interesting. The same thing takes place when you're not reading the Word of God. You're living your life, and you're having a spiritually weak life. You're spiritually skinny, and you're going through all these experiences that are testifying that you don't have the strength that you need to be able to navigate through all of life's problems. And if there was a man who understood this, it was Job. Job said in Job 23 verse 12, he said, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Friends, we have to treat the word of God better than our food. And we have to see that the same way we set time, no one here miss. well, some people do, but usually people look forward to the next meal. People look forward to eating food. I remember I used to eat five, six times a day. That's because I just enjoyed eating food. You enjoy snacking, you get discouraged, you snack. You're happy, you snack. It's like every single occasion, food is connected to it. The same way we should be happy with eating food is the same way you should be happy with going to feast upon the word of God. I don't know if you all have ever had a really good meal that has been so good that you remember the flavor for a long time. And then you remember this flavor and you look forward to going to eat the same meal again. Now, my mom is an amazing cook. And I remember growing up, she would make some things that were so good. And I was like, Mom, I'm not only going to have that for lunch, but I'm going to have it for supper and I'm going to have it for breakfast tomorrow as well. Because it was so good. Friends, when you approach the word of God, and you look inside of this word, when you read God's mind and you get to know who he is, it is so sweet. It tastes so good that you're looking forward to the next time you get to eat that meal. You remember that meal all throughout the day. You remember the words that were spoken to you. Has someone ever come and said something to you and then it hits your heart so much and it's like, wow, I'm never gonna forget that they said that. It's the same thing with the word of God. He wants the flavor to stay with you all the time, amen? The Bible also says in John 6, verse 63, it says, It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are what? Life. God is letting us know that his word is spirit and it is life. It gives us hope. It gives us life to be able to live by. It helps us with our physical life, with our emotional life, and with our spiritual life. But not only just that, we're talking about truth and how to navigate through life. The Bible also equates the word to a lamp. Psalms 119 verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now for those who are watching and for those who are here, I don't know if you've ever lived in a place where when it gets dark, there's not much light. I currently live in a place where when it gets dark and if there's no lights in the sky and if there's no lights outside, it is dark. And if you go and you run, if you go and you take a walk, you could trip, you could fall in something. It's the same thing. God is trying to say the same way you need a lamp to be able to navigate, to make sure that you're not going to hit anything. Or let's say you're driving your car. Have you guys ever driven in a dark place and then when you turn off your headlights, it's pitch black? Or if you turn on your headlights, you can see in front of you? And you know what's really interesting about headlights and a lamp is you can only see so far. You can see far enough to keep on going. 
It's the same thing with the word of God. When you're holding the word of God with you, when you're keeping it with you at all times, not setting it down and then walking away, otherwise you're going to fall and trip, but when you're holding it with you and you're using it to navigate, to know which way to go, you're going to know how to get through the issues of life. You're going to know how to deal with certain situations. You're going to know how to deal with different problems. And things aren't going to take you by surprise. The things that took some people by surprise, that they don't know how to deal with, that they're wondering, how do I deal with this problem with my wife? Or how do I deal with this problem with my finances? Or how do I raise children? How do I deal with this friend at school? You're going to know how to navigate through those issues because you have the word as a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. But even more than that, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. He that follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus wants us to know that when we're following after him, we can have assurance that we are not going to walk in darkness. When we're following after him, we're going to know the way of how to live. We're going to know the truth about life, and we're going to understand how is it that we can make it from day to day. Understanding all these things, though, we must ask ourselves, how do we practically study the word of God? What is the first step? The first step to understanding how is it that we can read the mind of God? That's pretty huge, isn't it? To understand how God thinks. In John chapter 16 and verse number 13, it says, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Not only just that, John 14 verse 26 says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you all things. Friends, to understand the mind of God, you need divine help. We need the Holy Spirit to enlighten our mind, to give us understanding. Without the Holy Spirit, we will not be able to understand truth. We will not be able to look at the Bible and to truly see what is it giving to us. This is why you can have this experience or you can meet people who've had this experience and they'll say, I've read the Bible front to back 20, 30 times, if they've actually read the Bible 20, 30 times. But if they've read the Bible front to back and they say, my life is still not changed, that's because they probably weren't reading the Bible with divine help. You see, the Bible is not just a regular book. It is a book from God himself. So it's letting, us un it's letting us know that when we come to the Bible to understand who God is, to understand what is truth, we need help. We need assistance from the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things, of the, um, the things of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. But the question is, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? How is it that we get this help that we need? Do we have to go on a long pilgrimage and search all around the earth for the Holy Spirit somewhere, for a spirit hiding under a rock or hiding under the bed? That's not the case at all. God makes it very easy. In Luke chapter 11 and verse number 9, the Bible says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. And then it says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I love this comparison. My mom loves giving gifts. I remember one Christmas, my mom had gotten myself and my brother and my sister, got us lots of different gifts, and they were pretty expensive. And I remember, I, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Atlanta there's lots of suburbs, and we lived in a suburb known as Snailville. And in Snailville, we had two other families that were very, very close to each, that we were very close. And we called them my cousins and my aunts. So we spent a lot of time with each other. And I remember calling my cousins at Christmas morning and saying, hey guys, what'd you guys get for Christmas? What'd you guys get for Christmas? And they didn't get anything. And when my mom heard about that, she wondered, she probably, she said, you know, they, their parents probably might not have the funds this year to be able to get them stuff. So my mom went to the store to go and buy my cousins each a basketball hoop and other types of gifts. And I was like, what? Like, this is expensive. And I was young, so I was like, where does all this money come from? And I was thinking to myself, like, wow, like she really loves giving gifts. That really spoke to my heart. And you know what's interesting? My mom always had this mentality of, I want to give gifts to my kids. She used to work at JCPenney, and she would come home some days, and she would say, hey, guys, I got you guys some clothes. And back then, I didn't really care how, what, what, about what I wear. I didn't really start caring until I was like 14. So when she would give us clothes, I didn't really think much about it. But looking back, my mom just wanted us to have gifts. She wanted to really show us, you know, she's caring about us. She's thinking about us. And to this day, she still likes getting us gifts. And you know, the Bible says, if your earthly parents, 
if my mom, who is not a perfect woman, if our parents know how to give good gifts, how much more the God of the universe, who is able to give anything and who loves you so much that he's willing to lay down his divine life for you just so that you could get to know him and have his Holy Spirit to understand what is truth. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. It's amazing. So we just have to go to God and we have to ask him. Ask him for the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if you, especially girls, if you have been a daddy's girl and you go up to your dad and you say, dad, I want this. Or let's say you go up to your mom first and you say, mom, I want this. And your mom says, no. And then you say, okay. And then you go to your dad because you know your dad is going to give it to you. And then you say, dad, I want this. And he's like, "Uh, no, you don't need that. It's like, but dad. And then, you know, you let them know. And then they're like, okay, I'll go ahead and get it for you. I witness this all the time with my sister growing up. So friends, that's with parents who might not know the best way or who might not do things in the best way. But our heavenly father is more than willing to give you the Holy Spirit. Amen. And John chapter seven, verse 17, another condition of receiving wisdom to understand truth. The Bible says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God. Friends, we have to come to the Bible. We have to come to the truth with an open heart, willing to understand and to hear what it is that God wants us to know. The Bible says in Isaiah 1 verse 18, come now and let us reason together. If you come to the Bible saying, you know what, I'm not going to listen to this, I'm not going to hear this at all, and you try to open the Bible and you have these other motives, then you're not going to come to an understanding of truth. But if you have a willing heart, if you say, Lord, God, I'm willing to hear what it is you have to say. I'm willing to try and follow you. He's going to give you understanding so that you can know the truth. But not only just that, you can't just read the Bible anyhow. Now, there's certain methods that people have put out there, Bible plans where you know you read through the whole Bible in 365 days. I've tried doing that at one point. You could do that and you'll probably get a blessing out of it. But if you want to get the best blessing out of getting to know God, getting to understand who he is, learning how to read his mind, so to say, you have to follow a certain principle. Isaiah 28 verse 10 says, for precept must be upon what? Precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. This is a very important principle when it comes to understanding the word of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. In other words, the Bible is full of so many different thoughts, so many different messages, but you have to compare the verses with each other so that you get a clear picture. I'm going to give you an example of this. We're going to go through a little test or a good example. We're going to look at two verses, Galatians 2 verse 20 and John 3 verse 16. I put them on the screen for you so that we could save some time. So the Bible says in John 3 16, we all know this verse, for God so loved the what? The world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not pay, will not perish, but have everlasting life. So this verse says that God so loved the world that who gave? That he gave his son to us. Now Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I live by by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now this is interesting. You might look at this verse and you can say, wait, the Bible's contradicting itself. How did God give him his son and he gave, but but the Bible says that Jesus gave himself? Or... Remember, we have to reason through the Bible, Isaiah 1 verse 18. We have to think. It wasn't that the father was saying, you know what? I don't want to give you up to the world. And Jesus was like, please, please, please. It wasn't like that. Or it wasn't like, you know, the father was mean. It wasn't like Jesus was was the person who was saying, oh, I don't want to go. And the father was like, son, you have to go to the world. That's not what he was saying. They were on a mutual agreement. They both loved the world so much that Jesus was willing to give himself He was willing to surrender himself for the world. And the father loves us so much that he was willing to give up his only son that they both agreed that they love us and they're willing to do whatever it takes to save us. Amen? So that's how you have to study the Bible. You have to look at one text. You have to look at another text to understand and to reason and to say, hey, I need to get a clearer picture here. You can't just read the Bible anyhow. Not only just that, we have to be aware of some things. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says, knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Beware of privately interpreting the word of God 
Always filter each text through another verse. Always understand every single verse in context with other Bible verses. The Bible says what can take place. In 2 Peter 3, verse 16, in all his epistles, speaking of Paul, it says, are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction. The writings of Paul, Paul was a very smart man, and he explained lots of different things. And people usually have trouble with his writings. So they'll look at his writings and they'll put their own thoughts or their own ideas or their own private traditions or their own past, and they'll bring that to their study of the word of God. But God doesn't want us to do that. He's saying you can't privately interpret the scripture. You have to study and compare scripture with scripture. You have to put all your biases aside, put the presuppositions aside, and approach the word of God with an open heart, saying, Lord, what is it that you're trying to share with me? And it might not even be just presuppositions. It could be traditions from someone who you look up to very highly. Even if it may be a pastor or a speaker who you may look up to, you cannot just go based on their own interpretation, but you have to do like what a certain group of people did. In Acts 17 verse 11, it was speaking of a group of people from Berea. They were known as the Bereans. It says they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures how often? Daily, whether those things were so. In other words, when they heard the word of God, they were open. They said, let's hear what he has to say. The same way you guys are all seated here, you're saying, you know what, let's hear what he has to say. But after they were done, they went back home and they studied the scriptures daily. They went through by their own and they said, it, does this make sense? Is this really true? Can I really trust this? And that is very, very important. You must always test the word of God. And you have to test it with two things. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, it says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this, it is because there is some light in them. There is no light in them, friends. That is very, very important for us to understand. If they're not speaking according to the law and to the testimony, which is another way to basically say, you know, the prophets and the Old Testament, if they're not speaking according to the whole Bible, then you cannot trust them. You have to compare what they're saying with the word of God. Amen? What's the end goal? What is the main purpose of truth? What is it that we're trying to accomplish in seeking after truth? What is it that God is trying to accomplish in giving us the truth? The Bible says here in John chapter 8, it says, You shall know the truth, and the truth may make you free. Shall make you free. The Bible has given us an assurance. Jesus has given us an assurance that we will know him. And when we get to know him, when we get to know the word, when we get to know the truth, we will be made free. But the question is, free from what? Am I in bondage? Like, I'm not a slave? What am I a slave to? Jesus said something else. In John chapter 8, verse 34, it said, Most assuredly, or verily, verily, I'm really telling you the truth. I say to you, whoever commits sin is the slave or the servant of sin. Jesus was being honest with them. He was saying, you're living a life that is committing sin. You may ask yourself, what is sin? What is so big about the whole sin deal? In 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, the Bible says, whoever commits sin transgresses or breaks the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. And you know what's interesting, friends? We may ask ourselves, you know, what's the big deal? But this morning, I asked you in the beginning, who has, been, who has ever been lied to? And no one here likes when they're lied to. And that's simply just following the ninth commandment. Someone who's ever been cheated on, who's ever been gone through a broken home or a broken marriage, that's usually from the seventh commandment or just anger, the sixth commandment. All of these things, problems that we see taking place around the world with killings and murders and all of these problems in the world today, it's because of sin. And God is saying, I want to free you from those things. I want to give you freedom from them. I want to give you an experience where you can experience happiness and peace and joy and experience true love with other people and not the pain that comes from sin. You know what's interesting what the Bible says about this? It says in Romans 13 verse 10, we read this, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. When we're understanding that we no longer have to be in bondage to sin, no longer have to be slaves to breaking the law, we experience true love. The number one thing that a lot of people are searching for, if not everyone in this world, is love. People are seeking for just happiness, for fulfillment, and just for, you know, peace. And they want true love. And God is saying, when you truly find freedom from all these things, you will be able to experience that genuine love, that love that you've been searching for with all your heart. Amen? David gave us wonderful, wonderful counsel. 
He said in Psalms 119, verse 11, he said, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Friends, the more time you spend with Jesus, the more you keep his word in your life, the more you will find freedom from those things that plague us. Not only just that, the Bible says in Psalms 119, verse 9, it says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to your word. How shall I find a clean way of life? Do you feel filthy this morning? Do you feel like, you know, there's things in your life that just make you feel dirty? Or you feel like there's, you just need a pure way of living life. You need a clean path to walk into. If that's the way you feel, God is saying, if you take heed according to my word, you will be able to cleanse your way. You will be able to have a clean life, a pure life. In John 15, verse 3, Jesus tells us, now, not later, but now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Jesus is giving us an assurance that the more time we spend in his word, we will have a clean life, a pure life, a life full of hope. In Revelation 15, verse 4, Romans 15, verse 4, the Bible says, For whatever things were written were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures or of the word might have hope. When we study the word of God, it gives us hope. It doesn't only give us hope. If any of you have ever felt anxious or you feel like you're just worried or you feel like you're just discouraged, Jesus says, thou would keep them or you will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you or stayed on thee. He's letting us know that when you keep your mind focused on the word of God, you have peace, you have rest. You no longer have to worry about those things that were bothering you. Friends, Jesus is calling us to study his word. He's calling us to spend time in his word, to get to know him, not just words on a page, but he's calling us to get to know a person, getting to know truth. And as we get to know truth, we'll understand the way of life. We'll understand how to navigate through life. He's simply asking you one thing. He's saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's saying, just come and try me out. Try. He's giving you a test. He's saying, he's putting himself out there. He's saying, just taste. I'm giving you a taste. If you guys have ever gone to Sam's Club or other places where they might put food out, they're giving you a taste of the food to give you an assurance or to letting you know, you know what? Here, this food is good. I have confidence in this word. And friends, the same thing with God. He's saying, I have confidence that my word is going to satisfy you. Taste and see that I am good. As you listen to this song, think about what the Lord is telling to your heart concerning his word and ask yourself, am I in need of the word of God?
was a man. He was sentenced to a long time in prison. And as he was in the court, and the officers were getting ready to take him back to the jail, he turned back and he looked at the attorney. And he looked at him with a very serious look. He said, I'm going to get out of here. And he said, when I get out, I'm going to come and find you. And then he turned away, and then the officers took him away. Now you can imagine as an attorney, he might have possibly heard these type of things before, but there was probably a look in that man's eyes that let him know that something was different about this guy. So time had passed, and the news actually came that the man had actually escaped out of prison. And he escaped out of prison, and now the attorney was really beginning to wonder, you know, maybe this man really is someone to be concerned about. So he did everything that he could to make sure that the house was secure, keeping in contact with his family, with his mom, with his wife, and those who stayed inside the home. And one day, when the attorney wasn't home, the mother and his wife, they were studying the Bible together at home. And as they were studying the Bible, they began to pray. And they decided to pray for the attorney, and they also decided to pray for that man, just praying that God would be with him, that God would reach his heart. And you know, they decided to go to bed, and that before they went to bed, they decided to check the doors, to check the windows, to make sure that everything was okay inside the house. So they went to sleep, and then the attorney came home. And when he came home, you know, he looked around the house, he looked around to make sure everything was fine, and he locked the doors, and he went to sleep. He saw that his wife and his mother were still sleeping. The house was okay. So he went to sleep, and he got through the night, and then the next morning, he heard a loud scream. And he got up really quickly and he ran downstairs. And when he ran downstairs, he saw his mother and his wife standing in the kitchen. And they were wondering to themselves, where is our Bible? But not only just that, their Bible was gone and there was a dagger left on the table. And they saw this dagger on the table and they were wondering, we checked the house, we checked to see if everything was okay. And they were wondering, what happened? So some time passed on. And there was a war that came out and the attorney had to go and fight in the armed forces. And he went to the war and he fought and this battle was really, really tragic. Lots of men died during the battle. And the attorney, he happened to get very, very wounded on the, on the battlefield. And the man, there was a man who came and saw him and it was actually a fisherman the next day. And he came and as he was looking around, he heard some moaning and some groaning and then he saw that it was the captain, the attorney, and he saw that this was who he was, and then he saw, you know, he fixed up his wound, he helped him out, and then he contacted the wife and said, you know, come and get your, your husband. Your husband is here, he's been wounded, but you know, he's okay now. So the wife comes, and then as he comes, as she comes to get him and they're getting ready to leave, the captain asks, he says, what can I do to repay you? What is something that I can do? You saved my life, you helped me. And the man said, you've already paid me enough. And then the attorney is wondering, I haven't given you any money. What are you talking about? Like, what do you mean I paid you enough? And the fisherman said, you don't remember me, do you? And then the attorney looks. And then the fisherman says, you sentenced me to a long time in jail. And I vowed that I would find you. And I went to your house when no one was there. And I hid inside of your closet. And I waited a long time. But as I was waiting, I heard your wife and your mother reading out of a book and praying. And I wondered to myself, what is it about this book that makes them so sincere? What is it about this book that makes their prayers so genuine? And as they kept reading through the book, they, he said, I have to read that book. I have to read that book. So when everyone went to sleep, he said he came out the closet and took the Bible and he said, I paid you with the dagger. And then he said, you have changed my life by allowing me to have that book. And you know what's interesting, friends? That book changed that man's life. And there's people today, there's people here who need to experience the same transformation that this book has done in that man's life. And friends, I just wanna make an appeal to you. For those who are listening and for those who are watching, if you see that you have never taken time to really open this book, you might have opened it in the past, but you never really opened it for the purpose of getting to know the truth, getting to know the man of truth, getting to know Jesus. And you say that that is what you want to do. 
I want to ask that you just raise your hand. Raise your hand where you are. I have a second appeal. You may have read this book before. You may have possibly read this book for a long, long time. And you see that you've been reading it, you've been having some experiences here and there, but you haven't been consistently getting to know the man of truth. You haven't been spending all your time with him, keeping the book with you in your heart, maybe even keeping a small Bible with you along the way. I just want to ask that you stand up and come to the front so I can pray with you. And I'm going to come to the front as well because I need that. If you see that you have been spending time with God, you might have been reading your book, getting to know Jesus, getting to know the truth, but you see that you just want to take another step to say, you know what? I want to continually spend more time with him. I want to make a better effort to keep his word in my heart, to keep the truth with me. If that's the case, let's come so we can pray together. And for those who are watching online, God may be speaking to you this morning. He may be saying to you that now is the time where you need to open up this book to where you need to get to know Jesus. And if that is the case, right now you can make a decision where you are. You can go and find the book online. You can find it with friends or whoever it may be. There's a Bible somewhere. And we're going to go ahead and kneel for prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful. I'm thankful, Lord, that we got to read your word this morning. Lord, it's a privilege to get to know the truth. It's a privilege to get to know the man of truth. Father, I thank you so much for giving us your son. And Lord, I'm just asking that as we embark on this journey to learn more about the Bible, I'm pleading, Father, that you'll open up our eyes to behold wonderful things out of your law. Please guide us, Lord. And for those who may be watching and listening, I'm asking that you'll lead them, Father, through the Bible. Help them, Father, not to get confused, but to see beauty in the word of God, that they may continue searching. And Lord, for those of us who have made a commitment to say, I want to spend more time in your word, I want to keep your word in my heart to make a better effort to walk with the truth, to keep the lamp in my hands. Father, I'm asking that you'll be with us as we decide to do so. Let it not be based on our promise, but upon your promise, that you will uphold us with the right hand of your righteousness. Thank you for hearing this prayer. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have been blessed by this presentation, then you will not want to miss the next presentation. If you're someone like me, you like to reason from cause to effect. You like to see if there's evidence in the scriptures. Our next presentation is going to be entitled, A Dream Come True. You're going to see how not only is Jesus the truth, but he really is God. How this Bible can be trusted intelligently and how you can trust it and share it with others in a better way. Amen? We're so pleased you can join us for this special event here at Watch the Hills Academy and College. If you've been blessed by these presentations just as much as I have, like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you would like to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description box below. Thank you so much for joining us. May God richly bless you.